Okay, welcome to the ELD MOOC. Welcome to this afternoon session, the second session in a row of uh, five presentations on uh, economics of land degradation. I'm Claudia Musekamp and I will be your host for the next hour. Um, last week, Robert Constanza took us on a tour around the world to learn more about global values of ecosystem services. Today, we are traveling to Botswana with Nicola Favretto, who will uh, introduce us to the different land uses in Botswana. Welcome, Nicola. Good morning, Claudia. <laughs> Welcome to our session. Uh, Nicola Favretto is an e environmental economist. He holds a master's degree uh, from the University of pa Padua, is that right, in Italy, and is currently uh, doing his uh, PhD research in England. So welcome uh, again, Nicola, and uh, I'll turn over to you for your presentation on Botswana. Okay, thank you, Claudia, for the introduction. Uh, let me just clarify that I finished my PhD, and uh, that's why I've been able to get then involved as a postdoctoral research fellow on uh, this uh, challenging and interesting research project funded by the Economics of Land Degradation Initiative. I have to say it is a great uh, pleasure for me to have the opportunity today to talk about the outcome of, uh, of our project. This was carried out uh, in cooperation between the University of Leeds, at which I am based, and the University of Botswana. And, uh, and I also have to say that I'm really grateful to the ELD team as a whole for the great support uh, provided in the past year throughout the different phases of project implementation. So today we will talk about trade-offs between different land uses in southern Africa and the focus will be on our case study in Botswana's Kalahari. First of all, let me just briefly outline the structure of uh, this presentation. I will first provide some background information on the issues of uh, land degradation and ecosystem services across rangelands. Uh, I will then outline the project aim and show the study area. I will then describe the methods that we use for the evaluation of the ecosystem services. I will not go too much in depth into the methodological issues because I want to leave some room for discussion on the key results of the study, first of all, and also to uh, discuss some of the key challenges that we faced uh, in the preparation and implementation of the projects and also some opportunities and challenges for the implementation of our results. Uh, all right, so last week, in last week's webinar, um, Robert Costanza gave a very good overview of what ecosystem services are and why uh, it is important to to give an economic value to them. Uh, and that was done from a global perspective. Uh, our study focuses on rangeless systems, which are uh, uh, a key source of rural income in, in the study area as they deliver a range of ecosystem services. Um, you see a brief list here. We are talking about food, groundwater, building material, a range of bell products, so wild edible plants and, and products that are used as natural medicines, uh, climate regulation, uh, recreation and spiritual values. And these systems do face uh, some major traits that it's what I define here as the dual traits of poverty and land degradation. Um, land degradation in different forms. We're talking about bush encroachment. If you look at the photo in the slide here, you see this is a game farm and, and the bushes are really, really thick. Uh, land degradation can be in the form of retreat of grass cover, which means uh, having a reduced access to good quality grazing, therefore having implications for cattle production, which relies on, on good grazing and reactivation of previously stable sand dunes. 
all of these problems uh, they they reduce the delivery and access to a broad range of ecosystem services and economic returns so we see how the environmental issues are directly linked to the economic uh, implications of land degradation. Uh, this is, sorry, um, it is uh, therefore really important to, to value these ecosystem services in order to identify uh, paths out of poverty and, and, to, and to fight uh, land degradation issues. And, in this particular case, the aim of our project was to assess the costs, benefits, and trade-offs associated with different land uses and land management strategies in rangeland systems. And our study was really was truly multidisciplinary in the sense that we brought together the economic dimension with the social and environmental dimensions of land degradation. And we did that by gathering primary data on a east to west transect in southwest Botswana. I will show a map uh, in the next slide where we basically covered four land uses. First of all, communal uh, grazing, which is open space land, non fence, accessible to anybody. Private cattle ranches, which are fenced areas. Private game farms, which are also fenced. And number four, wildlife management areas, which are protected areas uh, which aim to conserve wildlife and also provide access to ecosystem services to, to the people that live in the surrounding areas. This is the map of the study area. So you see we are in the southwest of Botswana and the red crosses are our study sites. And uh, these study sites cover all of the four different land uses that I outlined earlier. Uh, on the methods that we used, uh, the study used the so-called multi-criteria decision analysis that I will refer to as MCDA, uh, which allowed us to rank the alternative land uses, so the four land use options that I described earlier, by quantifying, scoring and weighting a range of quantitative and qualitative criteria. I will provide some more detail in a, in a few slides. Uh, here I wish to stress that uh, the multi-criteria decision analysis used uh, varied methods in the valuation of the ecosystem services. We integrated policy analysis with price data analysis. Uh, we carried out 12 ecological assessments based on biosphere based sampling and satellite data. I carried out 37 semi structure interviews across the study areas that I showed on the red crosses in the map. This was combined with a literature review and secondary data analysis and the use of the benefit transfer method. As again, I won't go too much in depth into the methodology. Of course, I will be happy to answer questions if you have in the end of the presentation. I think uh, we should focus on the main uh, research question that the MCDA was addressing, which is the following. Which land uses and land management strategies are best placed to deliver specific ecosystem services in Kalahari rangelands in Botswana's southern Kalahari district? So we defined a, a range of criteria which are shown in the table here, uh, which are the ecosystem services being delivered in, uh, in the study area. So food, fuel, construction material, groundwater, genetic diversity, climate regulation, and so on. Uh, we, design, we, uh, we identified indicators, one or more than one indicators, to assess the performance of each of these ecosystem services under the four different land uses. Now, this table is an output of the MCDA. It looks quite complex. Uh, um, it, it is just to give you an idea of, of the kind of matrix that we produced. If you look at the first column, uh, you got the criteria, so the ecosystem services being assessed. Then you got the indicators that were also shown in the previous table. And then if you see uh, column two to four, these are the four land uses that are being assessed. 
Um, the range of data that we used includes uh, quantitative and qualitative data. Where possible, we, we gave, uh, we used uh, monetary um, indicators assessed in US dollar per hectare per year. Where this information was not available, we used uh, other types of rankings and qualitative indicators. I think a key question that might emerge now is, okay, how did we compare the performance of different criteria as we've been using different units of measure? You can't really compare apples with uh, pears, right? That's what we did through the MCDA scoring. So we translated all of these assessments into a homogeneous uh, MCDA score on a zero to 100 point scale. Again, I won't provide too much detail on how we did that. If you have questions, feel free to ask later. I just wish to stress, if you look at this table now with all of the scores, there are numbers in bracket. The numbers in brackets are the weighted scores. Uh, what that, that means? It means that uh, an ecosystem service uh, might have a different importance or role according to policy preferences of society. And uh, so the numbers in brackets express the, the final score based on the relative importance of these ecosystem services to policy making. And I, again, I would strongly encourage you to ask more questions about how policy making can inform the weighting of the criteria if you're interested to hear more about it in the question and answer session. So, in the end, uh, this is probably an easier to understand output. If you look at this graph, it translates the final score of the previous matrix that I've shown into a graph that shows how each land use performed in terms of ecosystem service delivery. And if you see the first uh, one on the left, communal livestock grazing is the one that achieves the highest MCDA score. So it means that delivers the widest range of ecosystem services. And this is followed by wildlife management areas, private cattle ranches, and private game ranches. And what this uh, diagram tells us is really interesting because it contrasts with the traditional view in, uh, in uh, national policy, which uh, has always favored uh, private uh, ranches, so fenced land against communal land with the idea that these would promote a higher uh, level of delivery of ecosystem services and a better environmental conservation. Um, another output, key output produced under this study is this table which provides the total economic values for the ecosystem services for which uh, monetary uh, information was available. So we got the total economic values of commercial food production, so cattle production, groundwater, climate regulation, and recreation among the different land uses. And again, uh, let's just take an example. L let's look at climate regulation in the first column, communal li livestock grazing. We assess the uh, total economic value of climate regulation it accounts for at almost $9 million per year. Mm, this does not necessarily mean that uh, the ecosystem services shown under the different land uses are translated into actual economic value. Uh, this is the case uh, for cattle production, but this might not be ca the case for other ecosystem services for which there is no market or little market, for example, wild edible plants and other wild products, or maybe for which access to market is difficult or restricted, like in the case of uh, commercialization of carbon credits. I wish to highlight four uh, slides of key conclusions or findings from this study. Uh, First of all, we have to stress that cattle production does provide large financial benefits, particular to private uh, land users. But on the other hand, it does generate some broad negative environmental externalities that affect society as a whole. And uh, 
the government policies have been promoting intensively land privatization and fencing and provided heavy support also to borehole drilling for groundwater extraction. And this resulted in a high concentration of cattle around water points. Uh, if you please look at the photo on the top left of this slide, you see a green tank full of water which is uh, connected to a borehole and you see the water point, the areas around the water point get highly degraded and they also experience high levels of uh, bush encroachment and the retreat of grass cover, particularly perennial uh, uh, varieties of grass that are highly nutritious for cattle. When this is lost, uh, the livestock income decreases as well. And, uh, and uh, the more the land gets degraded, the, the more difficult access to other ecosystem services is. You have, people have to go further and further to be able to collect uh, wild products and fuel wood. So again, I think this shows really clearly how the environmental dimension of land degradation are strictly linked to the economic dimension and therefore the impacts on poverty uh, poverty levels are clear. Um, the concentration of cattle around water points and the degradation of land are combined with obstructed wildlife mobility and this was again due to the fencing promoted uh, through national policies. The fencing system has obstructed the mobility of animals that are not able to, to migrate when needed. And this is uh, resulting into declining wildlife numbers, particularly in and next to the wildlife management areas. And there is a bit of a trade-off here. If you remember, I mentioned earlier that wildlife management areas were created with the purpose of conserving wildlife but on the other hand, here we are achieving the opposite result. Wildlife numbers are decreasing. And when, when wildlife numbers decrease, this decreases also the economic viability of CB and RM, community-based natural research management and ecotourism activities. So again, this shows how the environmental dimension links also to the economic dimension. And overall, the opportunities for livelihood diversification of, of, uh, of the poorest people uh, in society remain limited and, uh, and are mainly based on cattle production. So there is certainly a need to assess and establish other potential markets for provisioning ecosystem services other than food markets for the trade of, uh, of uh, well products or natural medicines, for example. This could provide some added value to, to the local people that do rely on the, these ecosystem services, even if, if this is not visible from, from an economic point of view. And uh, there is a need to limit borehole development within the communal areas, particularly in proximity to the wildlife management areas, to avoid that kind of uh, cattle and wildlife conflicts. And uh, from a really overall perspective, when we, this study tells us clearly that when we try to pursue sustainable land management practices, it is not all about profitability because there are also implications about the social distribution of wealth. So it is vital to uh, consider the trade-offs between profitability, social distribution of wealth, cultural values, and land degradation. And these issues must be considered uh, across land uses, as we did in the MCDA, but as well as within land uses, because different results can be achieved within the same land use when different land management strategies are applied. For example, uh, a private uh, farmer, a private cattle farmer, has got a much higher financial availability than a communal one and is able, for example, if he's experiencing high levels of bush encroachment, to invest money in order to carry out some debushing. But debushing is extremely expensive. Uh, so 
two cattle farmers might be able to achieve different results based on different ways of managing their own land. Uh, now, uh, I, I would like to, to discuss about some broader issues that might be of interest to people that might be willing to carry out a similar research project on a similar area. What are the key challenging challenges that we face in the preparation and implementation of this project? I would say challenge number one definitely was obtaining a research permit. And this is a serious issue because uh, we submitted our uh, application and we've been waiting for several months before we got the first feedback from the ethics committee. We addressed their comments shortly and we submitted back and then we had to wait several more months in order to get the actual research permit uh, printed and signed by the government. Uh, but I was able to start my field work much earlier and this caused some, some major issues because of course there are project deliverables that must be met and, uh, and, uh, and if the permit is not there you are not allowed to, to collect any data. So how do you cope with this kind of problem? I think that flexibility uh, is the key, the key thing. Uh, flexibility in the sense of gathering as much data as possible when the research permit is not available, when allowed, and, and, and also flexibility in terms of adapting the, the research and the outputs based on what is available and uh, and not what is available is not always what it was uh, planned. Uh, but in the end, it worked out um, really well. Uh, I think that another key uh, constraint might be working across challenging rural setting, which is something that personally I enjoyed a lot being in, 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 a, in the Botswana Kalahari environment and traveling across uh, challenging areas, but it does really require the capacity to adapt to the local conditions. Uh, from a practical point of view, if you just look at these two pictures, uh, it shows that our car got stuck in sand, and you just have to be able to get out of, of small or big problems on a daily basis. And also, I think human capacity to establish a human contact is, is really fundamental. Uh, you get to meet a lot of, of uh, farmers and of local people and the interaction to me has been so deep and interesting. Uh, but it doesn't need the researcher to be open-minded and, and, and to be able to establish a link with these people so that they are able and willing to cooperate. And also another problem was the lack of reliable data. Uh, for example, um, economic, uh, I mean quantitative information are not always available and, and, uh, and reliable data on quantities and prices also is not always available. So I think that the use of the multi-criteria analysis allowed us to overcome this problem and to integrate data from varied sources. So what did, it, what did we produce in the end uh, out of this project? We produced uh, a number of deliverables aimed to, to uh, target different types of audience. Policy reports, two policy briefs, peer-reviewed scientific journal paper. Uh, we had a, a project website that you can find here. We organized and delivered a policy workshop in Botswana at the end of the project. We have a blog that targets a broader audience because it talks about the project in a more accessible and easy to understand way. And, and we had regular uh, Twitter updates. Uh, so what are the opportunities for implementing all of the results that we've been disseminating through these outputs? I think we, we did it uh, quite proactively. Um, we organized a successful policy workshop that was attended by a range of uh, key policy makers uh, from a range of government departments. We had the United Nations, 
on board, we had the civil society. Uh, that was quite a mixed composition of the participants in the workshop. And the aim of this workshop was to disseminate the research findings uh, to the policymakers and particularly to get feedback and discussions from, uh, about the findings and getting input from them. So it was not a one-way discussion where we would just share the findings, but it was just about thinking together and trying to understand if the problem that we identified are the same problem that the local stakeholders perceive and try to discuss ways to overcome these problems. And this workshop also gave us the opportunity to identify some major research gaps and to elaborate future research agenda, not only based on our own academic priorities, but on the actual needs of the, of the local stakeholders. So this was a very fruitful experience that I think that helped us to get a feedback on our work and get more concrete ideas for our future work. But also uh, it has been highly appreciated by the participants of the workshop because it gave them the opportunity to interact and exchange some views on the topics where they work on a daily basis, maybe just on their own perspective. Uh, of course, implementing the results poses also some challenges. Uh, sometimes political decisions are driven not only by scientific evidence, but some political and economic interest, which might not always be in line with the, with the recommendations of, of the project. And there are also some practical constraints from a financing point of view. The local institutions from national to local level might not uh, always have access to funding in order to be able to implement projects and programs uh, fostering sustainable land management. But overall, I think that this project uh, gave us the great opportunity to, to get to uh, put on paper for, with a scientific approach and systematic approach, the key problems that are there, that are somehow available on literature, and the key problems that are facing the local people on their daily life, and get to discuss these problems at the policy level. So hopefully, this can, these results can be used to inform the uh, new policy developments and the developments of new projects and programs. I think I, I've talked quite enough so far, so I will leave some room for questions uh, from the audience. So please feel free to ask any of that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nicola. Thank you for this uh, great insight into your work in Botswana and uh, the findings uh, you come up with. Uh, we'll open the floor to questions uh, today. Uh, we'll do that uh, by writing our questions into the chat box. So please, if you have any questions for uh, today's speaker, write them into the chat box. And uh, I see that uh, people are still saying thank you or even grazie mille in Italian. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, please uh, do write uh, questions. Uh, meanwhile, let me ask you one question. Uh, one question. You had a, a uh, one of the slides showed that um, ecosystem services are uh, much better preserved uh, if it's uh, if um, the use of land is not privately yes yes so would you say private land owning is a, a, a threat to um, environmental services no it is not because from a certain point of view uh, a private land user has got a better capacity 
to preserve uh, its own land because it is a fenced area. You can adopt rotational grazing. You are not in competition if you are rearing cattle with other farmers. You have a better control of your land, and you also have more uh, access to finances that allow you to be pushing if needed. So uh, this is a bit the idea promoted by policy. Private land use is just better. Uh, it can perform better and it can even produce, as the MCDA shows, higher economic returns to that few private land users that do own the land. But we do have to think that there is a, a, a huge share of citizens that are just communal in these areas that do rely on a wide range of ecosystem services that maybe might not play such a key role under private land use. So this graph shows, it doesn't tell us that communal livestock grazing is, uh, is producing more economic returns or, or, or against private land uses, but it shows that, for example, uh, wild food production, so the access to uh, wild products does play a key role in the life of these people. Mm. And uh, this is not formally valued from, a, from an economic point of view. And if there is no market, it is, it's not even visible, but it's there and it's, it helps to sustain the life. For a private user, getting access to some wild uh, edible plants is not as problematic because they can get access to food through different uh, ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it's also a lot about the trade-offs. We are not saying that one land use is just superior against the other land uses in uh, mm -hmm. absolute terms. It is about what land management strategies you adopt under each land use and how do you combine the land uses. For example, mm -hmm. the idea of wildlife management areas, which is the, the, the one that achieved the second best rank, is to conserve wildlife. And, and give access to people to ecosystem services, a wide range of ecosystem services. This is a great idea on paper, and on paper you can also claim that you are going to promote ecotourism and a lot of eco, uh, good economic activities. But on the other hand, if the, in the surrounding areas, communal areas, you, you, you foster the land, you induce land degradation through supporting a high level of borehole drilling and, and conflicts between cattle and wildlife, you end up creating empty corridors where cattle is struggling, the, farm, the cattle farmers are struggling, wildlife is not there in any case, and uh, ecotourism opportunities are just not there. So okay. it's really about combining, and we're not coming out with a, with a winning uh, solution, of course, because it's always about uh, combining priorities. And in policy, as in society, priorities will always contrast. The priority of the communal farmer will be different than a private game rancher, and so on. But it, it this to say that it is not all about... Okay. But the social distribution of wealth and the trade-offs between uh, different land uses must be considered. Okay, they, I've got uh, two more questions. One from Josephine. Uh, could you elaborate on the assessment of the total economic value for different land uses? Yeah. And do we have to perform MCDA model for each land unit? That's from Yuris Bulakovs. It's in the chat box. OK. Uh, two very interesting uh, questions. So let's answer the first one on the total economic value. Let me go back to that table. Okay, so um, these, or, or even better, let's go back to the first output of the MCDA. 
uh, here we assess the performance of the criteria, as I say, based on either quantitative or qualitative values. So the, the total economic value was assessed just for the ecosystem services for which we have a monetary, monetary valuation. Um, in the case of commercial food production, if you look at this table, we are assessing the overall value, the net profit of meat production. And these were assessed in different ways depending on the different land uses. Under private ranches, either private cattle ranches and game ranches, we did that have access to financial statements. Uh, every information is, uh, is kept on these financial statements quite clearly. So it was about going through the list of uh, revenues and operating revenues and expenses. And it was uh, uh, quite straightforward uh, to, to assess the value of uh, the net profit of meat production in these areas. Uh, in the case of communal livestock grazing, it is a different issue because communal farmers do not keep track on, of how many animals they sell and at what price, uh, etc. So this was based really on, on the data gathered through the interviews, talking to each single farmer and trying to identify trends and average prices and expenses and revenues this was integrated with literature, which gives us information on offtake grades of cattle and small stock in the study area. This was combined with price data analysis. Uh, prices were gathered through either statistics or, uh, or, or interviews. So it was really about combining different uh, data from different sources. And uh, just on climate regulation, we use the benefit transfer method and uh, market prices. So benefit transfer method means that we, we had estimates on, on uh, values of carbon sequestrations from similar studies in the study areas. And we've been adapted, adapting these studies based on the, on the local situation. Um, I guess that's enough on this question. I think um, on the on how I perform the MCDA model. So it's a question about the criteria weighting. Uh, I think I have an extra slide that I prepared, which provides more detail on the weighting of the criteria. If it can be of any help, I always prepare some extra slides in case I get any interesting questions. Um, so, first of all, I stress that I will perform the, the weighting of the criteria based on the relative importance of each ecosystem services to policy making. Uh, so, this table shows the, 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 all the policies that I've been analyzing. We got national policy on agricultural development, uh, game ranching policy, uh, national action program to combat desertification and so on. Um, I analyzed this policy through this course analysis and identified the key priorities and objectives of these policies. Mm. This allowed us to, to, to rank the criteria, so the ecosystem services based on their relative importance. And we came out with main weights. The, if you look at the table at the bottom of these slides, it shows that commercial food has got the highest weight. It means that plays the highest importance in policy making. Uh, and this is quite obvious if you think that 80% of the price of cattle is subsidized through different uh, mechanism and market instruments by policy. Then we got groundwater extraction. I mentioned before that borehole development and drilling has been highly supported. Still, the, the, the ecosystem service with the uh, smallest value, which is spiritual inspiration. Having said this, uh, mm, basically, we've got that table, I go back to it, which shows Sorry, the system is a bit slow. It's not like going through PowerPoint, but we will get there. 
hopefully. Okay, so we got the, the full MCDA score, uh, you see in the table, and then each of these full scores were multiplied in the final equation by the, the crit each criterion weights. And this gave us the scores in brackets. And then we just sum up all of the scores under each all the criteria for each land use. And you can do that through specific software. There are several MCDA softwares available, or, they can, or this can be done just on Excel. Uh, you set your equation and you calculate uh, your scores. I hope that was clear enough. If you need any clarification, please uh, feel free to ask. Uh, and uh, I think, do we have any questions that mm -hmm. I've seen? Okay, there's time for one or two more questions, but uh, uh, I mean, there's always an option to raise these questions in the MOOC forum. Uh, I'll be happy to send it over to Nicola Favetto and uh, take uh, the answer into the back into the forum. So if uh, this really inspiring presentation does not raise any question, I would uh, I would say thank you Nicola. Thank you for this great insight into your work and uh, all the uh, work you have done with uh, policy makers in uh, Botswana. Thank you very much. And um, next week, uh, let me announce that, next week we'll have Louise Baker from the UNNC, UNCCD Secretariat talking about uh, ELD as part of the uh, global uh, soil leadership academy. So that will be Louise Baker at the same time, same place uh, online. So um, yeah, again, Nicola, thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Claudia, and thank you to thanks to all the participants. And uh, please, uh, feel free to get in touch with me if you if you want further clarifications or any questions. Otherwise, visit the project website. The web link is available in the slides and you will get all of the reports and policy brief and all the outputs that have been produced under this project. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And now we come to the fun part. If you want to switch on your webcam, you are free to do so. I'll can uh